On this Monday night, a troubling prognosis from Toronto's top doctor. We are approaching a new pandemic. The rise of more contagious variants as some provinces relax restrictions. Finally! Plus, anxiety over education. I don't want to be homeschooling. The teenager emerging from a 10-month coma. I don't know how Joseph will ever understand how his family is trying to explain the pandemic to him. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with promising signs, easing restrictions and deep concern about what could be around the corner. COVID-19 cases ca case counts are down in many parts of this country. Health officials credit the diligence of Canadians abiding by public health guidelines for bending the curve downward. The seven-day average of new cases has dropped by more than half over the past month. But there is a good chance it won't stay that way. Every day, more cases of the highly transmissible variants are detected in Canada. In Toronto, a case of the variant that first emerged in Brazil has been confirmed. The city's top doctor has this warning. We are in a transition from one pandemic to another. A transition to a new pandemic. We are in a position of great uncertainty with respect to variants, but what we know is alarming. Decisions to reopen do not come with guarantees, except that cases of COVID-19 will rise when we interact again more frequently. The variants are easier to catch and easier to spread, and there is uncertainty about the effectiveness of vaccines against them. South Africa has suspended a plan to use the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine on frontline healthcare workers there after a clinical trial suggested it's not effective against the South African variant. In the midst of all this uncertainty, some provinces are easing restrictions. Ross Lord has our top story tonight. The Ontario government suggests it's striking the right balance between public health and the economy. We will be able to protect our people, our frontline heroes, our communities and our businesses. The Premier says stay-at-home restrictions will continue for most of the province, but in the coming weeks, Ontario will cautiously transition regions to gradually reopening based on infection rates. On Monday, schools reopened for students in 13 public health units, including Windsor and Hamilton. Elsewhere, Nova Scotia is allowing more people into retail businesses and fitness centres, increasing limits from 50% to 75% full. Quebec is expanding businesses that can open to include non-essentials like hair salons. And Alberta has decided to allow in-person restaurant dining, along with limited school and team sports a welcomed taste of normalcy. It feels different, like obviously it's not very busy, so it's kind of a different atmosphere, but it's also like comforting to be back. A small reward for recent success against COVID-19. So I think the fact that we've been seeing declining case counts overall uh, have really been a sign that people have been taking things more seriously. Manitoba says it's considering slowly easing restrictions later this week, while BC is extending restrictions indefinitely, heeding the advice of Canada's chief public health officer. Theresa Tam is repeating that it's crucial strong measures are kept in place in order to maintain a steady downward trend. Researchers warn some provinces that go easy are inviting more trouble from highly contagious variants because measures like contact tracing are still lacking. It strikes me that this rush to open many things at once is not the most strategic endeavor. He says looser rules mean a third wave of COVID cases in the spring becomes more likely. Ross Lord, Global News. Newfoundland and Labrador reported a jump in cases today, the largest single-day increase since April of 2020. Eleven new cases of COVID-19 were confirmed there, pushing the total number of active cases to 27. Health authorities have suspended all group recreational and arts activities in the St. John's area. There are also new visitation restrictions on long-term care homes to reduce the risk to the elderly. Restrictions are being eased in Quebec, even though cases of the variants have been detected there, and politicians and public health officials acknowledge their spread could quickly change the game. Amanda Jellowicki reports. Finally! We have our life back! Yes! 
Yes. This Montreal woman celebrates the reopening of Quebec stores with a shopping trip. For sure, COVID is here, but we're alive, happy, smiling, and yes, there's a life at the end of the tunnel. After being closed for six weeks, non-essential businesses reopened today. It's the first step in a gradual loosening of restrictions. Reopening is key. It's going to save businesses. Uh, it's We don't expect it to be a problem in terms of health. But many in Quebec worry about the impact on public health. I would have said that we should have kept non-essential businesses closed for longer. Quebec COVID cases spiked over the holidays with over 3,000 in one day. Hospitals warned they were on the brink of catastrophe. Since adopting an 8 p.m. curfew last month, cases now hover around 1,000 a day. The Premier admits reopening is a delicate balancing act. I think it's calculated risk, uh, and it's a balance also taking into consideration mental health. But some argue cases are still too high. It's like we have our fingers around the neck of this, uh, of this pandemic, and this is where, instead of loosening our grip, we should be tightening our grip. Experts worry with new, more contagious COVID variants already in Canada, loosening restrictions could backfire. Because if you stay home, you can't catch the virus from somebody and you can't pass the virus to someone. Over the weekend, Quebec surpassed 10,000 COVID deaths, the highest in Canada. It's a number that looms large in a province opening up while the virus is still spreading. Amanda Jelowicki, Global News, Montreal. The rollout of vaccines in Canada is still lagging. This week, just over 70,000 doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine are expected, far short of the 366,000 a week that were planned. And Canada will receive no doses of the Moderna vaccine. The company delivers its vaccine once every three weeks. The next scheduled shipment isn't until the week of February 22nd. The country that has the highest vaccination rate in the world still has rising case numbers. In Israel, more than a third of people have now received at least one dose and a national lockdown is in place. But COVID cases are still rising in part because of the fast spreading variants. It is now confirmed the variant first identified in the UK has been detected in nine cases of an outbreak at a Toronto meat plant. Belmont Meats voluntarily closed over a week ago as cases began to spread. Toronto Public Health has confirmed 95 cases connected to that outbreak. Recent exposures of the UK variant at schools in Alberta and BC do not appear to be spreading at this point. Students at five schools in those provinces have attended classes while infectious with the more highly transmissible virus. As Heather Urex West reports, early data is giving reason for cautious optimism. Sarah Park has four kids. They're all back in school right now, and she hopes to keep it that way. I don't want to be homeschooling. My kids don't want to be home. But Park admits the new variants worry her. Her oldest has already been sent home to isolate twice, and she worries that could start to happen more frequently if variants take hold in the community. The concern is that it is a more highly transmissible strain, which means it can spread from person to person more readily than the um, other strains of COVID-19 that we've seen. That's what happened in this small Dutch village near Rotterdam last November. An outbreak in an elementary school led to more than 120 cases. More than a third had the UK variant. After testing everyone in the village, the local public health agency found the new variant was spreading more easily. But among children, the difference was small. It turned out the results were reassuring. There was somewhat more spreads, but the differences were minimal. Canada has had less experience with these variants, but early data on some of the country's first school exposures has been reassuring too. After a person attended class at Garibaldi School in Maple Ridge, BC, while infectious with the UK variant, 80 people were tested, and every test came back negative. The results of the testing that we did out of caution to ensure that we were picking up any transmission showed us that the safety plans that were in place in that school worked. It's a positive sign. It's too soon to be confident about anything. If anything, Dr. Kellner says the new variants leave schools with a smaller margin for error when it comes to things like proper mask wearing and physical distancing. It's a time to be reminded that this is important and it does make a difference. It's advice Sarah Park is taking to heart. I know masks aren't cool and I know as teenagers no one wants to wear them. 
But if it means the difference between in-person school or more time learning at home, she hopes the extra vigilance will pay off. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. The energy sector is digging its way out of the COVID doldrums. The price of the global benchmark Brent crude surged by more than 2% today, climbing to above $60 a barrel for the first time in over a year. The boost is credited to a cut in oil production and optimism about recovery from the pandemic. And Bitcoin surged to a record high today after being energized by electric car maker Tesla. The company revealed it has stockpiled more than $1.5 billion U.S. in the cryptocurrency. Tesla says it will also start accepting it as a form of payment. That pushed a single Bitcoin to more than $43,000 U.S. today. The price of the cryptocurrency has risen by 50% this year. Two investigations are now underway into allegations of inappropriate behavior involving the former chief of the defense staff, General Jonathan Vance. Canada's former top soldier allegedly had an ongoing relationship with a woman he significantly outranked and made a sexual comment to a second, much younger soldier. Let's bring in Mike Lecouture in Ottawa now. Mike, an investigation into such a high-ranking general is highly unusual. How could this case proceed? Well, Donna, when the structure of discipline inside the military was first established, it's unlikely they ever thought the country's top soldier could potentially face a court-martial. In a general court-martial system, the accused is judged by a panel chaired by a senior officer. The senior member of that panel must be equal to or higher in rank than the accused. Problem is, in the Canadian military system, the chief of the defence staff is the top soldier. General Vance will be tried if he is charged under the Code of Service Discipline and tried by court martial, he will be tried as a general. There is only one other person who holds that rank, and that's the chief of the defense staff. And if the chief of the defense staff is the referral authority, he cannot be the senior member of the panel. Exclusive reporting by Global News last week revealed General Jonathan Vance allegedly had an ongoing relationship with a woman he significantly outranked, including while she was under his direct command, and that he allegedly made a sexual advance over email to another woman who was a young corporal. The Canadian Forces National Investigation Services has opened an investigation and interviewed one of the women allegedly involved. General Vance has denied all allegations that he ever acted inappropriately towards any female subordinates. Sources told Global News the military ombudsman raised concerns with the defense minister in 2018 about alleged sexual misconduct by General Vance with women in the forces. Women. Defense Minister Harjit Sajjan insists any information about allegations was passed along to the appropriate authorities. Why didn't he act? And if his answer is, as it appears to be, well, I told someone else to act, uh, I think the ball still passes back to him when they didn't. And that's exactly why they're holding an emergency meeting of the Parliamentary Committee on National Defence on Tuesday. Donna. Okay, Mike, look at you in Ottawa. Thanks. What a difference 10 months makes. Coming up, a young man emerging from a coma to a radically changed world. There's a remarkable story from England tonight about a teenager who has no memory of the pandemic. He's been in a coma for 10 months. Now he is beginning to recover from it, and his family is trying to explain how the world has changed. Redmond Shannon has his story. When Joseph Flavel was hit by a car on March 1st, he suffered a severe traumatic brain injury. His aunt says doctors weren't sure if the 18-year-old would survive. Joseph was clearly in a lot of pain. All his muscles were contracted. Um, he had a tracheoscopy um, that was dislodged, which led to aspiration pneumonia. Lying in a coma, Flavel's life was on pause. Weeks later, much of the planet also shut down for the global pandemic. Even though Joe was unaware, he wasn't unaffected he got COVID on top of everything else. He's since had it again, unfortunately, but at that time we were very concerned. Last May, the sports-mad teen should have been at Buckingham Palace receiving a gold Duke of Edinburgh award, which honours youth achievement. For months, he remained in a coma until just before New Year's. A miracle. He began waking up. 
Joseph can can hear us. We know he can hear us because he responds to small commands. I mean, I don't know where um, and how we can explain to Joseph what, the world that he's woken up into. Perhaps the hardest thing to explain is why his family can't be at his bedside. His FaceTime smiles bring them to tears. You know, Sharon, who's Joseph's mum, will say to Joseph, I really want to be with you, darling. I'm sorry, I want to come and hold your hand. Don't be scared, because obviously for Joseph, he's woken up um, not, and he hasn't got any of his loved ones around him. Joe, now aged 19, faces a long road of rehabilitation. His family is just thankful he's finally starting that journey. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Hopefully, uh, Ahead, the new federal Green Party leader and her new political strategy. There has been no federal election call in Canada yet, but it could be coming in the months ahead, and all parties are preparing. It will be the first election for the Green Party's new leader, Annamie Paul. She has been focusing on policy announcements, including the campaign for a universal basic income, a shift in focus for the Greens. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, joins me. David, you also discovered something that could distract from election preparations. Donna, last fall, the party's executive director quit after some party members raised concerns about his work for a previous employer. But some other party members thought those concerns were unfair and they thought the party handled the case poorly. And now those party members want the party leadership to address this issue. And so they have sent a letter to the party's federal council. A copy of this letter was obtained by Global News and they explained why. A pattern of poor governance has taken hold at the Green Party. Qualified, effective and innovative professionals within our party are often pushed away. We, as a party, must do better. The letter was signed by the party's former interim leader, Joanne Roberts, a former national campaign director, Jonathan Dickey, and others, including a past president and a past party president. Current party leader, Annamie Paul, took over weeks after the controversial personnel decision was made. It's not having an impact on our electoral preparedness. Paul's bigger challenge is to convince Canadians her party is about more than just climate change. Polls show that while climate change was a top of mind issue for most voters in 2019, the pandemic has changed that and voters now are much more concerned about their own health and their own ability to pay the bills. As a result, expect Paul and the Greens to have a different emphasis in 2021 than the Greens did in 2019. There is no climate justice without social justice as well. And so during this pandemic, our focus has been, while never forgetting the climate, of course, uh, has been on ensuring that people don't fall through the cracks. The Green Party will also have a new tactical focus this spring, aiming squarely at the NDP, trying to turn the two dozen orange seats in the House of Commons into two dozen green seats. Donna? Okay, David Aiken in Ottawa, thanks. New team, no problem. Up next, Tom Brady continues his Super Bowl dominance. Edmonton's still nameless CFL team now has a short list of seven names to replace the old one, the Edmonton Eskimos. It is asking fans to rank the names in a second and final survey. The short list is the Edmonton Elk. The Evergreens, the Evergolds, Eclipse, Elkhounds, Eagles, and Elements. In the NFL, the Kansas City Chiefs have stopped short of changing their name despite intense pressure. And on the field at the Super Bowl yesterday, the team was no match for Tampa Bay and quarterback Tom Brady. The 43-year-old won his seventh Super Bowl. As Eric Sorensen reports, it is getting harder for his critics to deny his greatness as a player. It just didn't seem possible. It's a physically brutal sport, and he's 43. He should be limping to the Hall of Fame. Instead, Tom Brady has broken seemingly unbreakable records that were set by Tom Brady. 
Super Bowl 55 will be remembered as the Pandemic Bowl with fewer fans, but it was also supposed to represent a changing of the guard. Young Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs were favored, but in the end were no match for Brady and the Buccaneers. Some of the greatest quarterbacks, Unitas, Namath, Montana, quietly wound down their careers in unfamiliar uniforms. It seemed Brady was doing the same, his legacy forever a patriot, as a Buccaneer hardly recognizable. But instead of fading away, Brady won his seventh Super Bowl, one of the great achievements in sports history. You're looking at the greatest right there. Well, I think they're all special. There were no grand pronouncements from Brady. You want to get this far, you got to get the job done, and we did it. He's careful. For all his accomplishments, Brady has been one of the most polarizing athletes in pro sports. He and his old team were accused in two cheating scandals for spying on another team and for deflating footballs. Brady was also criticized for not taking a strong public stand when Colin Kaepernick raised awareness of racial injustice and was apparently blackballed by the NFL. When your teammates are taking a knee, how can you not see color? Use your privilege to amplify social justice. That's what he's failed to do. It's all added up to a sharp divide in public perception of the man. I hate Tom Brady so much. And he knows it, reading a series of mean tweets about himself last week. Hi, I'm Tom Brady, and I'm a crybaby. Hope everyone has a great Monday, except for Tom Brady. But as a player, even some skeptics have been won over. I have finally acquiesced what he has done over his career is flat out unparalleled and phenomenal. I think we knew this was going to happen tonight, didn't we? Tom Brady is controversial, but is he also the greatest player of all time? It's complicated. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is the Emera Oval in Halifax. There are beautiful spots all over this country. Please email us yours to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.